Nanog's new executive director, Jonathan Black. Jonathan is joining us from his home country in Canada. Jonathan, where exactly are you located? So I live in Ottawa, Canada. It's kind of halfway between Toronto and Montreal, if you know those cities or their sports teams. And uh, it's the nation's capital. So it has a lot of uh, unique and sometimes odd features being the nation's capital. I, I'm sure. So tell me a little bit more about you. Where, where are you originally from? Where'd you grow up? I, I grew up in a border town, Niagara Falls. Uh, Twin Cities with Niagara Falls, New York is Niagara Falls, Ontario. It was a, a, a fun place to be in, especially in the summer. There were lots of people around, lots of opportunities for summer jobs as a kid. Uh, spent most of my my childhood there in in that area. Lots of opportunities for summer jobs. Okay, yeah. so what what was it? What was the dream job when you were a kid? The dream job. They used to have these. Uh, they called them view mobiles. You know, they they have them at Disney and just sort of the the train buses that take you around the city. And and the best job was to be a driver on one of those view mobiles. I, I never got that job. I was stuck in a gift shop counting postcards and shaking uh, snow globes all day. But um, it, it was, uh, it, that was kind of the, the ideal job was driving a view mobile. Huh, I can see that. Well, you got to start <laughs> somewhere, right? Yeah, for sure. So what are your hobbies and interests outside of work? Well, outside of work, um, I do some photography. Um, I love digital photography because it, it's like the shotgun approach. You can just hold the trigger down and uh, don't have to pay for any films. So you take as many shots as you can. Little known secret, I have over 100,000 images on my computer. And, and that's not to say I'm prolific. It's that I'm a poor organizer and I don't delete stuff. I guess I'm a digital pack rat. I do some photography. I also uh, enjoy skiing and uh, coaching kids sports. Oh, that's so much fun. Uh, what an experience coaching kids, huh? You have kids of your own, correct? Yep. My wife and I have been married 33 years. We have four kids from 17 to oh. 26. Yeah. Two boys, two girls. In today's terms, that's a pretty big family. It is a big family. Yeah. I bet it makes life fun. Fun and busy. My my oldest son was saying it's surprising. Just this morning, he said it's surprising. We have three cars. Mm -hmm. And we still can't coordinate who gets which car on which day, which time of the day. So that's yeah. a good problem to have, right? Yeah, lots of <laughs> lots of uh, good problems. So what's one interesting fact about you that most people don't know? I, I actually asked one of my friends yesterday, because I thought you might ask this question. And he said, you know what? The fact that you've coached over 35 kids sports teams, that's a bit odd. And, and kind of interesting. So yeah, I'm out of those days now. Our youngest is uh, just finishing high school. But uh, yeah, a lot of minor sports coaching. Wow, that is really cool. I mean, that's a completely different world. I, I didn't play that much sports when I was um, growing up. But my sister, her sons are heavily involved in sports. And it's it's a full time job. And it's it's a culture in itself. She's always at ball games. Right. You've told me a lot about your personal background, a lot of coaching um, that just probably helped you come to be where you are today. Can you briefly describe your professional background as well and how it has prepared you for the role of executive director at our organization? So really, you know, the, the early days, it was computer science, software development. Many, many years ago, think C on different versions of Unix, uh, then into finance, mostly around uh, financing technology companies and venture capital at the height of the internet bubble. I was in the technology venture capital world, then joined a startup on the downside of the internet bubble, I, the, the bursting of it. So maybe my timing wasn't so great. But from there, I've been involved in a fair bit of not-for-profit work, both uh, as uh, sort of on the charity not-for-profit side, as well as in the internet not-for-profit world here in Canada. So what specific experiences at your previous roles have been most helpful to where you are today? Well, the, the most relevant is for the past 13 years, I was involved in, a, in an internet association in Canada called CanWISP, the Canadian Association of Wireless Internet Service Providers. It's basically a, uh, an, an industry group for rural internet service providers. And for a couple of days a week, I've been running the organization, organizing their annual conference, uh, doing some lobbying. I know that's a, that's an awkward word to use, depending on uh, your background. You may or may not have a, a good vibe when someone says they've done some lobbying. I've really seen it as education 
the uh, policymakers, the lawmakers don't understand rural internet. They don't understand how it happens, uh, who's doing it. And those small companies don't have the budget to to make themselves known in the in the nation's capital. So really, that's been the role is educating the government and policymakers, regulators on on this whole industry. So I, I was one of the founding uh, members when I was working at a regional ISP here in Ottawa. Uh, I functioned as the first treasurer of the organization. Uh, I've managed all 12 of their conferences. And I realize, I mean, you're at Nanog 91 coming up. So I realize 12 isn't a big number, but hey, it's uh, it's it's what I've done. And, uh, and we've had to manage through COVID as well through that time. But as well, really bringing the organization to the point where the government, the policymakers, the regulators are reaching out to us to get our input on some of their major decisions. So that's been a real, uh, very direct correlation, running an organization, managing the relationships between the members, uh, the, mem the in our case, the attendees of the shows, and as well, the, the sponsors and the companies that frankly fund a lot of the organization. So managing all of those different relationships, making sure they're all being uh, looked after, cared for, that you pay attention to their opinions, that you know who they are, that's been probably the most relevant part. Certainly, uh, early days in uh, in the internet, I've been involved in the internet for quite a while. So um, all of that is, uh, I think, led to this spot here. That's quite a background. Um... What inspired you to pursue a career in this field? It's really been more of a, a journey than a plan. Um, it's it, it starts out uh, in, in loving you know math and computers, doing computer science, and and just following what I wanted to do next. It, it is not a grand plan. I did not end up here uh, knowing that this is where I would be at the beginning. But really, I think what what has uh, kind of been a uh, for the past sort of twenty years plus, it's been the internet finance and and watching the internet develop. I still remember logging onto my first web page in 1996, Netscape Navigator, if any of you remember that. Netscape had gone public probably a year or two before that. And it was a fascinating uh, visit to a website. I hadn't been really involved in the bulletin board era. Uh, certainly been an email user for many years before that, but that experience of seeing the HTML pages load was was really seminal and i think you know to have um watched the internet grow as being involved in finance and then in the delivery side of the internet um it's been fascinating uh to see that the difference it's made in in uh the world so much of what you said i think a lot of our community can relate with can you share a memorable moment or highlight from your career thus far just one can i can i do more than I mean, one the, the floor is yours yeah, so one thing that I look back on as being pretty seminal was uh, early in my computer science days, I was at a small technology company. We were doing software for not-for-profits, actually. And one of the guys, one of the, the software developers, had been at a, a wine and cheese or a, a, a beer night the night before, and he bumped into the network administrator from York University and said, hey, we'd like to get on the internet. Can we like connect with you guys? Can you forward store and forward our mail and, and we'll exchange email with you? Uh, he said, sure. So came in the next day and he gave the co-op student the job of, of connecting our office to the internet. So it was a quick Unix shell script and a cron job. And then uh, twice a day, because who would want to exchange email more than twice a day? We would connect to the York University uh, email servers and uh, exchange email with them. And, and we were online and it, uh, that was pretty uh, a pretty fascinating, exciting thing at the time, and uh, really way back in those in those early days. On on a bit of a different angle, I think um, one of the sort of memorable moments is um, about four years ago, just pre COVID. I had a call from uh, a software company in Ottawa, and they said, "Hey, you know, we've we've known your work for a while." Um, We've got something we'd like to discuss with you. Can you go to lunch? Basically, at lunch, they said to me, the, the two owners, they said, look, we want to sell our business. We can't run it and sell it at the same time. So we need you to come in and help us. Are you interested? I said, sure. They said, okay, there'll be an offer in your inbox this afternoon. I started three weeks later when we were interviewing uh, investment bankers. We sold the business nine months later, and I stuck around for about a year of integration. But 
what was um, sort of the the highlight was that they were willing to trust me with with that role in their business to basically be the number two to the CEO, come in as VP finance. And, and as they said, Jonathan, we need you to pick up anything that falls off her desk. She was the CEO. He was the CTO. I said, you're going to be there to catch anything that falls off the desk. We trust you to do this. Let's go. And it was that instant trust. I mean, it had been built over a relationship over a number of years. Uh, ironically, they had come to my VC firm about 15 years before asking for money. And we said no. Uh, but despite uh, despite that rejection, we stayed in touch. And uh, so many years later, they came back and said, look, you're the person we want to do this job. But it was that trust that they're willing to put in me and to step into the role uh, with an experienced you know, uh, management team that had been together for a number of years and, and be able to function quickly, uh, to be able to function at a high level um, with a, an under underlying foundation of trust was very key and, and was something I'm... I'm I remember. Who has been a significant influence in your life and why? When I think of my career, there was a, a senior partner at uh, the venture firm I was at in Toronto. And we're still in touch. We still get together uh, a couple times a year. But it was interesting. He had come through um, a pretty you know, typical banking background. And uh, he had words of advice for me. Like, you know, Jonathan, there was a time when my wife uh, said to me, you need to be home more. This is getting, you know, you're working too much. He said, you need to take that. You need to take that into account. You need to to live by that. To which I think I replied as we left the, the office at 8 p.m. that night, well, you just gave me another task to do for tomorrow morning. When would you like me to do that? But it was that sort of relationship that we built, that trust that we had in each other. And, and uh, we're still friends today. I still look to him for advice now and then. I think like you've had a lot of great mentors in your life. How do you feel about mentorship? Oh, um, several years ago, probably five years ago now, as I was running my consulting practice, I, I thought, you know, if I'm going to take this to uh, a new level, if I'm going to be better tomorrow than I was today, I need some help. And so I, I reached out to someone that I worked with on a, a charity integration. We can talk about that in a minute, but um Someone I highly respected. He'd been a management consultant uh, in a couple of different countries. And I said, hey, I need you to be a, a mentor to me, to be a coach for me. And uh, so I, I engaged him and we're still we still talk regularly. And um, he he had been and done a lot of the things that I wanted to uh, to become and a lot of the things I wanted to do. But it was really having someone that I could turn to and and get some advice from. And his advice isn't always the right advice, but it's different advice. It's someone from the outside looking in. One of the things he does for me is after I complete each of my consulting assignments, he he checks in to say, okay, you know, I'm I'm an advisor to uh, Jonathan. Uh, tell us how it went. How how did the relationship go? Was it what you expected? Did you get what you expected? Did you get value you didn't think you would get? And then afterwards, he kind of takes all of those uh project summaries and uh and synthesizes it and says okay so you know this is what we've heard from many clients here's here are your strong points here are the things you need to work on and to have that outside voice looking in has been really important i i completely agree that uh outside voice looking in is can be so invaluable uh sometimes we're just too close to see something accurately what's a personal achievement you're particularly proud of it kind of goes back to that um, trust part again. In my in my mid thirties, I was involved in a charity. I was on the uh, I was chairing the Canadian board, but the international board asked me to become take on the role of chairing the organization. It was uh, about a three thousand uh, employee charity, working in uh, eighty different countries. I think about a hundred million a year in revenue, and to be again to to have that opportunity, first of all, and second, to be trusted with that role in in mid thirties was was a, a big um, was a big responsibility. But it was, it was also something that um, you know, if I'm allowed to be proud about stuff like that, I, I guess I was or would be. How do you stay motivated and focused? Something that was fascinating about living in the world of venture capital. Uh, first of all, everybody wants to talk to you. You're everybody's friend, and they. Um, 
they all want a, a piece of your money, so they treat you differently. But, but what was also fascinating about it was you're spending time with other passionate people, people who, you know, st- founders who have committed their career, committed, you know, thousands of hours of their life to a, a given company or project, and they're very smart people. So to, to hang around with smart, passionate people and, uh, you know, for, let it rub off on me um, or to catch their vision, uh, understand their passion and, and come along with them. Uh, that's been a big part of keeping the, the passion alive. Yeah. Do you have a personal mantra or quote that you live by? Yeah, it's it's not something I say as much as I, I try to live, um, but I believe everything is, is more of a marathon than a sprint. Uh, you don't get a lot of benefit from Uh, a sprint, you get a lot more benefit from a marathon. If you approach a project or a a challenge, say, look, you know, this may not be solved in a day, a week, a month. This is going to take, you know, uh, weeks and months and longer to, if it's to solve this problem or to get through this challenge, the challenges are often much bigger. The challenges are deeper and more complex, but uh, generally I think life is more of a marathon than a sprint. Mm, I like that. What's your Favorite book, movie, podcast, TV show? Oh, well. Or um, all of the above. Yeah, all of the above. Um, so I've got a couple. I, I really enjoy Ted Lasso. I've been uh, soaking in those episodes, enjoying them quite a bit. As uh, as far as books go, I'm looking forward to reading a book called Rogers v. Rogers. And some of you will be familiar with the Canadian telecom market. Uh, there's a family that runs a uh, uh, one of the largest telecom companies in Canada, Rogers Communications. It's obviously the Rogers family. And uh, there's been a fascinating boardroom CEO uh, clash take place over the past couple of years. All kinds of interesting things like the butt dial phone call where the CEO learned that the CFO was trying to replace him because the CFO butt dialed his boss during a conversation anyway it should be a really interesting book i'm looking forward to getting into that but those are those are a couple of things on my list huh, that does sound really interesting what is that book called again rogers v rogers rogers v rogers okay i'm gonna have to check out that one can you tell our audience a little bit more about the pictures behind you and what they mean to you yeah so um I often change the pictures behind me um right now i've got a picture of the eiffel tower that i took um, it was a, a foggy night, so you can see the lights at the top of the Eiffel Tower uh, reflecting off some of the fog that was there. Uh, I did not plan this shot. It was a total fluke. Uh, and like I said, I probably have a thousand pictures from that night. And that was the one that turned out well. The other side is uh, is a Thai street art. It's a tuk-tuk. If any of you have been to Asia, you've probably written in one of these. Many, you know, the, the artist wasn't anyone uh, famous or well-known and didn't cost a whole lot, but it's a, a colorful memory from uh, some of my past travels. <laughs> I love that picture. That's so impressive that you took that. It's neat. I like it too. I am a huge traveler. Uh, tell yeah. me what countries you have traveled for leisure and why. Oh, you know what? I, I haven't traveled for leisure a lot. Most of my travel has been for uh, the board work. I've chosen to travel to the U.S. That's what most of my leisure travel is or or through Canada. Um, but some of the countries I'd like to go back to or that I've never been to would love to go back to Egypt. Um, had a fascinating Nile River cruise in Egypt. Um, and I love Southeast Asia. I love sort of that area of the world. The food and the people are wonderful. I have never been to Italy. Um, never been to, you know, some of those famous sites. Um and I've been to I've been to a number of countries, but when you're on charity travel, you're you're lucky if you get a day or two to do the tours, and then you're in. It's like a business meeting, right? You're in the yeah. city for a weekend or a week, yeah. and you have a day of travel on either end. Um, but I try to fit in some touring while I'm while I'm traveling. Yeah. Where in the states do you like to go? I've been through. I've been all the way down the west coast and the east coast um, to Florida and Key West on the. On the Good east side, actually driven all the way down the coast highway from Vancouver, Canada to San Diego, and then walked into Tijuana. Mm. We've done that. Um, but yeah, we'd love to explore more. I uh, would love to spend some time in Colorado skiing, possibly. Haven't done that yet, but uh, maybe the time will come. So what attracted you to our organization? I mean, can I just say the internet? Um, mm. 
it's the the internet nothing has changed the world like the internet has and i'd say nothing may change the world going future as much as the internet will in 1996 i went to a trade show called comdex mm -hmm. uh, computer dealers expo i think it was technically called and at that show larry ellison uh got up and handed everyone a t-shirt that said the internet changes everything that was 96. bill gates wasn't quite as sold out on the internet it was an interesting tool he hadn't quite embraced it like larry ellison had and, and i expect larry ellison was taking his stand partly to uh be a contrast or a foil to bill gates they they've tended to have that kind of relationship but to have seen how the internet is uh self-governed uh, often driven by volunteer efforts, uh, organizations like um, like Aaron, like the Internet Society, the the various uh, operator groups around the world. It's really fascinating to see how the not for profit effort, non commercial effort, has led to such an open, robust, and secure uh, tool around the world. And really, to be uh, involved in that, to be more involved in that and to have a, a hand in influencing and, and seeing that it is open, robust, secure going forward is a, is a, a real so honor, I'd say is a good word for it. So what's something new you would like to bring to Nanog? Wow. Um, so I haven't had a lot of exposure to Nanog. I did visit Nanog 90. And I would say first few months are going to be spent really listening and learning, questioning. Um, and then, you know, along with, with the, the team and the board, we will work on sort of a, a, a new plan, how we want to build on the foundation that Nanog has and where we want to take it. And again, this is going to be a marathon. This isn't a sprint. I wouldn't expect to see huge changes in the next months. Um, but really to, to see that Nanog is still functioning uh, is a, a relevant, vibrant, inspiring. That's another word on, on sort of in, in the Nanog uh, dictionary. Uh, that Nanog is still fulfilling those roles and and its vision will be a a real tribute to the to the community and to what we've been able to do with it. So I, I don't have a lot of sense of where we're going to be, and I hope that doesn't disappoint you. But I hope as well it it it's out of respect for uh, the Nanog community, what has been built and the foundation that's there, and a desire not to break that. Whatever we do in the future needs to build on that, not break it. Do you have any short-term goals? Yeah, I mean, my the the short-term goals for Nanog are, are really uh, in a couple of ways. One is that I need to uh, become part of the Nanog fabric and need to build on the, the trusting sort of environment that's there today, both in the team and in the greater community. Um, the other part is we need to establish our, our financial sustainability going forward. It's been tough since since the days of, of COVID. And uh, the organization in, in some ways needs to find its footing again. And uh, those are two sort of immediate near-term goals. But again, you know, I see it as a marathon, not, not a sprint. What is your leadership style and how do you adapt it to different team dynamics? So probably the thing that's consistent in all of them is I love to ask questions. And I love to ask questions in an environment of trust, where I trust that each of the team members is looking out for the best interests of, of Nanog, and that each of the team members is, is putting their, their best efforts forward. Need to adapt that various times of the year. You know, people do run into issues. They need to personally deal with matters that, that mean they're not always 100% uh, available. But really, the, the, the team dynamic is very important and the ability to understand each other, that we have clear uh, understanding, clear communication, would really rather not um, have to deal with conflict, and it will come sometime, but really want to deal with conflict in a, in a direct way, and in a way that is um, open and upfront, and uh, that really is looking out for the best of the organization and, and the people in it. What motivates you most about our mission, and what do you find most fulfilling about it? the internet being open, robust, secure, uh, that Nanog is an educator and inspirer of, of the next generation of people who are going to implement it, who are going to guide it. Uh, to be at the core of that is really exciting. And uh, I hope we can continue to fulfill that role. Um, but really that 
the self-governing volunteer efforts um, that have led the internet is just a, a fascinating place to sit. Mm, I agree. We've talked a lot about your prolific background in coaching. Uh, how do you foster a positive organizational culture? Yeah, um, I think it has to start from the top, and I think it's uh, it's a uh, demonstrating in one on ones, in group sessions, in conversations, um, demonstrating that openness and that ability to ask questions and not be afraid of the answer, to focus on the the greater good, if you will. Uh, but fostering that really has to start at the top, and and I hope we can model that right from the beginning as a as a small team. And as we reach out to the various uh, stakeholders and parties around the NANOG conferences and, and uh, input tables. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, I, uh, I'm i really looking forward to, uh, I mean, right now we're sitting about a week away from start date. I'm looking forward to digging into meeting all the various uh, people around the NANOG committees and tables. And uh, really looking forward to meeting everyone and, and hearing and feeling, sensing their passion for the mission of NANOG. Well, thank you so much for joining us on behalf of everyone here at NANOG. Welcome to NANOG. It's good to be on board. Our next meeting, NANOG 91, will take place June 10th through the 12th in Kansas City, Missouri. If you haven't registered, make sure you do. You can have your opportunity to meet Jonathan in person and ask him your own questions. Mm -hmm.